A pleasant Thursday afternoon to all of you. Brandon Warren here for the Brandon Warren Podcast Project. And today, I'd just like to track down a couple of different so- suggestions that were made to me from people on Facebook that I missed last podcast earlier this week. Basically, ran out of time as we try to keep it under 15 minutes here for listenability and sustainability, and also because I'm only permitted to upload 15 minutes at a time. So, let's dive right into the questions that you all so lovingly crafted for me earlier this week. First things first, Aaron Summers from Fansided. He is the director of recruiting for Fansided.com, a blog network similar to SB Nation. He asks, what is the biggest thing that you learned in the press box all season? And as, as many of you know, I was the Twins beat writer for 1500 ESPN this year and just wrapped up my first season on the beat as a media member, uh, full-time media member covering all the Twins' home games. I would say the biggest thing I took from being in the press box all season was basically, uh, there's a lot of lot of different facets to approach to this, but I would say there's a lot of accountability from the sense that pe- people always wonder why you don't rip players or why it's so difficult to rip players. The problem is you got to stand down the barrel of the gun the next day and talk to that player if you rip them, and you have to hope that what happened with Brandon Phillips and that media member in Cincinnati doesn't happen to you. And so the biggest thing is, too, you have to be you have to be absolutely positive that the things you say are things that you have a lot, hold a lot of conviction towards. And so it, it can be difficult to rip a team that you see day in and day out and... And to be honest, don't, you know, things things change so little day to day in baseball that finding rippable things on a day to day basis can be difficult, if not impossible, unless you're you're stepping back and looking at the broad scale of things. Uh, other things I learned, I mean, obviously you want to treat people with respect, and they'll respect you back. And I mean, it was a great experience. I I was asked right after how the first season went, and I said it was a, an unbelievable grind, but I loved every minute of it. And I said that without even thinking about it, but now that I look back, that that's the answer I'd give if I even stopped and thought about it. So, yeah, just a wonderful experience that first year, and I'm hoping for next year to be just as good and many more years to come. Second question we have is from Ben Fast. Ben is a former Northwestern College soccer player and one of my college classmates, actually. And he asks, what are your thoughts on Dusty Baker getting canned following the playoffs? And... Yeah, I mean, that that's a big, hot contention because he's led the team to the playoffs here the last couple of years and 90 wins. He, he's He's been exactly what this team needed when they were kind of slumping about four or five years ago when he took over. I think the biggest thing, because people will compare it to Ron Gardenhire's situation in Minnesota where he's lost 90 straight, uh, three straight years of 90 losses, is Dusty Baker doesn't have the history in the Reds organization that, that Gardenhire has with the Twins organization. And... You know, while that may be construed as wishy-washy, I think, I mean, Gardenhire's been in the Twins organization, I think it's like 25 or 30 years. I mean, ever since his playing days ended, because he, he thought he was going to crack the 87 team and would have been the utility guy. And so he's been in the organization ever since. So I, I guess 25 years would, would make sense. Um, it, it, it's apples and oranges, really, because Baker's a more legendary manager. But I think his... The, the culture around that club in Cincinnati was that he just couldn't get them over the hump. And, and you know, maybe, maybe that was the case at one point in Minneapolis here with Garden Hire, but at the same same time, the Twins as an organization have shown extreme loyalty. Only two managers since, since 1980, September 1986. Most teams averaged like seven in that time frame. So, yeah, I mean, I, I understand from a, from a layperson's standpoint why people would say, oh, Dusty Baker got fired after all these playoff appearances, sort of like Mike Hargrove did from the um, from the Indians all, all those years ago. But at the same time, I, I just I don't think the situations are analogous I- exactly. And I think whoever takes that Reds job is going to absolutely love it because lots, lots of wonderful talent in that in that town right now. And it's a team that should still contend. I mean, Pittsburgh's going to be tough going forward. The Cubs are already on the upswing. And, and let's not forget about the Cardinals, who might be the best organization in all of baseball. But I think what you'll find is this that, that Reds job, that, that's a team that should hang around for a while still with a lot of good young talent. The next question is from David Lorilla. David is a colleague of mine at Fangraphs and actually was a, was a colleague before at Baseball Perspectives. He's the interview guy. And so he's basically known for being 
one of the best guys in the business at conducting interviews of, of all different types of, of people, whether it's players, front office personnel type. He even did one of John Gordon, the Twins broadcaster, as he was retiring a couple years back. So, yeah, check out his work at Fangraphs.com. Uh, David Larilla, one more time here. He asks if the Twins should replace their scouting director. And uh, that's Darren Johnson. Uh, he took over for Jim Rance, who retired after uh, 50-some years in, in baseball. And, and obviously Rance had a, a great legacy, and you know, Johnson took over. and He's responsible now for draft, uh, I believe, the last four or five drafts. Uh, David continues. He says, in 2009, they drafted Kyle Gibson instead of Mike Trout. In 2010, they took Alex Wimmers instead of Christian Yellick. In 2011, Levi Michael instead of, you know, top pitching prospects kind of all over. Uh, Byron Buxton is obviously a feather in his cap, but then he also says Cole Stewart's not a great draft choice. So let, let's tackle each of these points kind of individually. I, I still think the Kyle Gibson draft pick from a back-then standpoint made sense because Gibson was considered a higher-tier talent with, uh, I believe, forearm issues that had pushed him back to pick 20, 22, something like that. Now, I think every team would like to have a do-over that passed on Mike Trout, who was taken in the 20s by the by the Angels that year. But, I mean, it, revisionist history being what it is, you can't really kick yourself too much for that one. Obviously, Gibson got hit pretty hard this year, but he, he still has some potential. He's still not all that old. I think he'll be 26 next year. So, yeah, really hard to fault him for that one. Alex Wimmers has been a, a, an unmitigated disaster. Christian Yellick has been a, a pretty much a beast in the Marlins system. So, yeah, you can see that being bad. I, I think next year's a make-or-break year for Wimmers in the sense that they got to get him on the mound. they got to get him into the upper levels and see if he's ever going to make it to the big leagues. And at this point, I, I wouldn't bet in his favor. But that, that was part of that time when the Twins were drafting college pitchers. It was kind of the tail end of it, the Slowies, the, the Garzas, and... Bakers and basically, you know, towards the end there, it just started to flame out a little bit. And obviously, college pitchers should be among the safest people you can draft. So hard to fault the Twins there. But th that Wimmers fell apart, Matt Bayshore fell apart. Uh, you know, Luke Bard hasn't done much. The, the last few drafts have been pretty bad. Uh, again, Byron Buxton is is a huge feather in the cap of of everybody in the Twins system. But now now David goes on to say Cole Stewart, arguably not a great choice. I'm not sure how I feel about that because the Twins are addressing pitching. You know, they're picking number four. Stewart's got the best prep arm in the entire draft. I, I don't think I can argue with that one yet. I think it's I think it's too early to tell. He he certainly looks like he could be an ace in the future, but he's he's obviously a few years off. And I think Stephen Gonzalez could end up being a a pick from this last draft too that could could turn some heads. But as far as replacing Darren Johnson, I, I'm not sure that I would consider that, and that's before even considering the Twins' uh, absolute unbelievable loyalty to those who are within the system. I, I just, it is, it's not going to happen. I think, I think a more aggressive team or a team that didn't value stability as much would certainly consider it. But I think, I think Darren Johnson's job is, is absolutely safe. The, the next question we move on to is, is Hudson Belinsky. Hudson is a friend of mine from Baseball Perspectives. He interned there after I did. And actually, he's more of a prospect guru. He just recently took a job with the Tampa Bay Rays as an associate scout. He goes to Cornell out east, so he's he's definitely got a, a big brain and uh, an affinity for prospects. So keep him uh, on your radar as an up-and-comer. He asks, who plays more games at third for the Twins in 2014, Trevor Plouffe or Miguel Sano? That, that's a fabulous, fabulous question, and I'm going to lean towards Miguel Sano. I'll tell you why. I think Sano is going to skip AAA, so I think they will probably send him back to AA to start next year. But I think before June 1 or July 1, he's already going to be in Minnesota playing third base on a regular basis. And I think the best thing for Trevor Plouffe is to, to play first base, play right field, play left field. I mean, not, not give up on playing third. Who knows? Maybe an emergency second base option. Basically, turn him into one of the better utility players around uh, definitely, definitely play him more against lefties because obviously he's shown more of a proficiency at hitting southpaws. But I think what you can do with Ploof is he's kind of a poor man's Michael Kadire at this point in his career. And, and before people say that's crazy, look, look at the splits. I mean, Kadire only hit lefties up until this year. This year he started hitting righties a little better, and that's probably more of the Coors effect. But yeah, the, the Twins have a valuable piece in Ploof if they can dispatch him 
in an efficient way. And I think that that would be, yeah, playing him as utility guy, moving him all around, because he, he obviously can't hack third base defensively. That's that's become clear. I, I, just, I just think you move him around, you get Sano settled in at third, I think Maurer settles in at first, and you've got the makings of a pretty good infield with Brian Dozier over at second and Yosemiel Pinto behind the plate. I mean, you get go get a shortstop, and you've got the you know, the core infield there for, for quite some time. So, yeah, Hudson, I'm going I'm to say Miguel Sano plays maybe 80, 85 games at third base next year, and that, that already puts you pretty much over the, the midpoint for a 162-game season. So, yeah, give me Miguel Sano to break onto the scene next year and take that third base job and run with it. Uh, another question here is from Jay Nelson of rotowire.com, a buddy of mine who's actually from Plymouth here where I live. And I, I kind of already did this. He says, defend why Cole Stewart was actually a great draft choice. And, yeah, I, I mean, I think I think Stewart fit a need, and not in the sense that a team would draft for need, but that high-ceiling pitching prospects is basically what this this organization is, is short of or it, you know, has a, a paucity of. And I think Stewart kind of fits that bill and can and slot in with a, a Trevor May, an Alex Meyer, a, a Jose Barrios to some extent, and basically restock the the prospect refrigerator when it comes to to starting pitching. And the, you know the Twins haven't had a lot of luck drafting high school starters. I think Glenn Perkins, if I'm not mistaken, is probably the last one to come through the system. And I, I'm sorry, he was drafted as a college player. I'm, I'm, that was kind of stupid of me to say. Um, I, I you know they, they haven't had a lot of luck with high school pitchers coming through. It's been mostly college uh, polished college guys. So. You know, it, it is bucking the trend, but kudos to the Twins for also breaking away from the idea of, well, this hasn't been working. Let's try something new. Let's see what the rest of the game is doing. And so I, I have to applaud the move for Cole Stewart, even if he is three years away. And to wrap it up here, we got one last one from Nicholas Campion. Nicholas is Mighty Minneapolis on Twitter, and he I think sometimes he says things to kind of get on my... Uh, to, to kind of get me on edge and see what I say back to him. I try to keep my head pretty good, and I've met Nicholas in person. He's a good guy. Uh, very tall, uh, recently married, has some speckles of gray hair in his head, so d don't think I didn't notice that. But a uh, big soccer fan, actually, or football, if, if he might prefer. And he asks, is Sid Hartman still cutting, on, uh, cutting in line in front of hardworking, underpaid interns in the media dining room? And <laughs> I have to laugh. Lots of good Sid memories from this year, uh, whether it was interviewing Terry Ryan with cottage cheese on his face or demanding that the cafeteria staff make him a cheeseburger when they were they were serving chicken or uh, the one day he didn't even make it to the park because he got into a car accident on 55 because he ran into somebody. I mean, uh, Sid is one of a kind, and uh, he, he's good for... Good for a lot of things. Good to obviously say something that's going to leave your mouth open. He's good for spilling his helmet Sunday in the press box every single time he's at a game. And he's good for one game pretty much every homestand. Um, Sid, we, we, we needle him a lot, but I think we'll all miss him when he's gone because he is an icon. He's uh, he's almost a pop culture phenomena here in Minneapolis, and I, I don't think there's a lot of guys like that in a lot of markets. So, yeah, you know what? We, we get a good laugh at Sid, and we know he can't hear us when we're snickering, but, um, you know, he's... He's still good old Sid, and uh, you know, he just does what he's done all these years, and that's uh, be at the forefront of the media. Anyway, that's it for, for this iteration of the Brandon Ward Podcast. Get your questions in. Get them into warren1500 at gmail.com or hashtag warrenpod on Twitter, W-A-R-N-E-P-O-D. Until next time, we'll see ya.